The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. So, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I joined the faculty at MIT Sloan in 1998, so it's almost 19 years ago. <laughs> Time flies. I came from, from Greece. Uh, I, I came first to Brown University, where I did my degrees. And uh, my passion in my research is about using analytics uh, in order to influence businesses. And in particular, I am very much uh, interested in the retail side, where I have done a lot of work, but also other areas, uh, some examples here in transportation and in the energy space. In particular, uh, I think I want to go to the last bullet point of this, where my goal and where I see a big gap is a big gap between uh, academia and industry. So my goal as an academic is to try to bridge this gap and to educate the future generations of PhDs and master students to better uh, bridge the gap in that space. So <clears throat> what is analytics? You can argue that the analytics is an approach that starts with the data in the middle, it builds models in order to reach and create uh, intelligent decisions that will create value for the company. And as our Dean uh, Schmidtlein would say, it is in a way our prophetic science, if you want to use two words for it. And <clears throat> therefore, one of the projects that I thought I would talk to you about where we are starting to see impact is promotion planning, uh, leveraging consumer information in order to increase uh, profits. I first want to make sure I give credit to a team of PhD students from the Operations Research Center that have participated uh, in uh, this project. And also to the folks from the Oracle RGBU part that have also uh, participated in this project, a project that has been going on for about five years. Now, what is the, let me talk to you first a little bit. What was the problem? Why did we study this problem? What motivated us? Talk a little bit about the data. Talk a little bit about the approach that we did. And then show you what was the impact that this approach is starting to have. So it was all about promotions. And I'm sure all of you go to the supermarket uh, to buy things potentially every week. And what is a promotion is you notice that there is a temporary reduction of the price, which you might see even on the shelf. For example, Barilla sauce, it's $1 off in this example. Or you, buy to, you go to buy these 12 ounces of coffee, and it's $1.70 off. Then you go back next week, and you realize that this promotion is over. So therefore, you have the regular price, and then after a week, the price has been raised to the regular pri uh, price as well. So the question that we asked is, when should retailers promote? How deep should they promote? And how often should they promote? And of course, promotions, although we used a lot of data that came from the supermarket industry, as we found out as we went on, this applies to many other industries uh, as well. So it's not so uh, pertinent only to supermarkets. Now, you know, the first question we asked, and there's a debate about that, is should retailers even promote at all? And when you talk to retailers, they would tell you that they use promotions for a number of reasons. One might be that they want to increase their sales overall. Another could be that they want to increase traffic in their store. And you may have heard of what is called the loss leader, where people would basically promote even at a loss one product, but they know that they will bring in uh, customers where they will make money on the other products that they will buy. In addition, if this is a new product that they are introducing and they try to capture the attention of the consumers, they also would run uh, deep promotions for that reason. And of course, this is also a lever so that uh, retailers can actually uh, bolster uh, the, um, their customer loyalty. 
And you will argue that this is also a way to price discriminate. So for example, my PhD students will only buy products when they are in deep promotion, where you and I, for example, might buy even when the prices are higher. So let me give you an idea of the overall promotion planning process and what it entails. It starts with the manufacturer and then the retailer. And the way it works in practice is the manufacturers offer vendor funds for their products to the retailers, meaning they are giving them a discount to the retailer, which they are hoping that they will also pass to the consumer, so the consumer is actually want to buy their product. From the retailer point of view, they have to choose among multiple uh, vendor deals like this. So they have to decide which ones do they want to take and accept. And then, of course, a key piece is that then how do they price actually their items? When do they promote which items and how deeply? And finally, what is the method or if you like the vehicle they should promote with? Should they use flyers? Should they use you know, Facebook ads? Should they do what's called an NCAP promotion? I'm sure that you've all seen in a supermarket at the end of the aisle when products are being promoted and are being placed there. So this is the whole, all the, all the steps of the promotion planning process that need to be addressed. And today, because I only have 35 minutes, <laughs> I'm only going to focus mostly on the promotional pricing piece, and I will talk a little bit about the vehicle selection problem from the retailer's point of view. Starting from the beginning, prices in a supermarket and, and managers are selecting how to price from a discrete price ladder. Where is this price ladder coming from? It's coming from the fact that for each product, there is a regular price, <clears throat> and then levels of discount. In a supermarket, you must have noticed that an important business rule is that, pr that prices end in nine cents. The reason is, psychologically, consumers, if the product is 5.99, they anchor on the five, and they, they anchor more on the, nine, on the $5 price versus to, in reality, you, if you were to be rounding up and thinking logically, really the product's price would be $6. So this is the first important observation that gives rise to a price ladder. Now these are all the issues that you need to address in order to determine your promotions. So on the left, you want to space your promotions because if you don't, then you will, you will cause uh, promotion fatigue and you will notice that actually customers will not be so susceptible or will not be willing to buy at a promotion if the promotions are very much next to each other. There are also, for example, inter-item rules. For example, if you are promoting the small size of the shampoo and the large size of the shampoo, you want to make sure that the price of the small size should be smaller than the price of the large size. Also, you want to address issues such as seasonality effects, such as cross-item effects, and I'm going to get into those very soon. So what is the problem that we are looking into here? Throughout, say, a quarter, about 13 weeks, what should be the prices that you select for which product each week? Making sure you obey business rules like the ones that I described in the previous slide. So it is what is the right product to promote at which time and at which price. Now, the issue is that in a given supermarket, the, the retailers are dealing with, at any given time, 40,000 SKUs. SKU stands for stock keeping units. And at any point of time, they have about 2,000 that they are on promotion. Now, in addition, we are talking about ma many stores with many items, and therefore, the problem is uh, challenging for the human brain uh, to, to tackle. 
And when we started uh, working with Oracle, we realized that this was done very much ad hoc in practice. And there was lots of money left on the table for the retailers. But in addition, it was not so good for the consumer either, because the consumer was being confused with all the products they would see, were not offered the right prices. So it was not a win-win situation for any of the stakeholders, the retailer versus the consumer. And therefore, there was room to apply analytics in order to, apply to, to address this problem. And that's where we came in. You know, in the business, people talk about you know, tier one, super tier, and mid-market type of clients. And just to give you an idea, a tier one client will have an annual revenue between one to five billion. And we'll have about of the order of 1,000 uh, stores with 200 categories and 50 to 600 items. And as I said already before, a supermarket on the average would have 40,000 stock keeping units, out of which about 2,000 will be on promotion. This just to give you an idea of the context and of the scale. So what's the philosophy in the tool that we built? We try to capture the, the, the reality. We try to capture consumer behavior. And at the same time, to build a model that was simple enough so that we would get the buy-in of the retailers in order to use it. Obviously, finding this golden medium between simple and yet at the same time realistic is not necessarily an easy task. Also, our philosophy is when you build and you use analytics, you want to use the data to speak to you, if you like. So in other words, you want to be able to directly estimate your model from the data available. So you want to make sure that the right data is available by the retailer that you are using in your model. You want your model to be easy and scalable, because if you build a decision support tool, it needs to be a decision support. Namely, the managers should be able to very easily run what if scenario of various kinds, changing various levers in the model, so that in the end, they can decide what's best for their business. And of course, at the end of the day, if anybody is going to use any analytics tool, it better be bringing significant value uh, to the retailer. Otherwise, they will go with business as is. So this is what we did. We built a promotion optimization model that tried to capture three things. One was the business rules of the retailers. Second, time dynamics. And last, uh, cross-item effects. Then, of course, this is the technical part that I will not talk about here, obviously. And then the implementation and the pilot with a 3 to 10% profit improvements that I will discuss which in a thin margin industry, this is a pretty significant amount. Let me show you some data. This comes from coffee. I always like to show data from coffee because I'm a huge coffee drinker. I already have two huge cups and I'm missing my third. <laughs> so this is from a big supermarket chain and the top plot is showing you the prices. The top is the regular price and this is normalized price, namely, it's not that the, the regular price is $1. It's just that it's normalized to $1. And so you see in week four, there is a 10% discount. Uh, in week seven, there's a 20% and so on and so forth. And at the bottom, for each of these weeks, you can see the corresponding sales that they are volume of sales that they are experiencing. So First, you see that this retailer in their current business is promoting 23% of the time. And the promotions is accounting for 41% of their sales. It's interesting, actually, that there's a study by Nielsen that basically seems to quote a very similar number as what we saw in our data. Now, I want to bring your attention. Because remember what I said in the philosophy slide, you want the data to speak to you in order to build any analytics model that you will be building. So here you see two weeks that are very close to each other, where although the discount is larger, this is about 30% off versus this is about 20% off. And with a deeper discount, you actually notice that you have lower sales. 
Intuitively speaking, this doesn't make uh, sense. You would think that when you discount deeper, you should be doing better and not worse. In addition, you see after the promotion is over, that basically the, the sales dip, and they dip to a lower level than before the item was on promotion. So something seems to be going on that we saw consistently in all the data sets. And you know, the explanation that we found after talking to practitioners is that these promotions are very close to each other. And when I go to the supermarket and I notice that paper towels are on promotion, I will stockpile. And so if the supermarket puts the paper towels on promotion the week after, I've already uh, bought a lot, and therefore I will actually not care about the discount that they are giving me. So we, s we very soon realized that stockpiling was actually an important effect that we had to incorporate uh, from consumer behavior in whatever model that we actually, analytics model that we actually built. So <clears throat> as a result, this stockpiling effect, we incorporate it in our model by having this parameter M that we, we estimate it directly from a data, and I will show you how different models give different memory. What do I mean by memory? It means, I, it means that when I go to a supermarket, I have an idea of what last week's price was and maybe some week before. And for different products, I am going to care more or less about past prices. So for example, for yogurt, I will have a different memory than what I will have for paper towels. Something that I will also explain uh, uh, soon. In addition to stockpiling, there are cross item effects. So this lady goes to buy Barilla pasta and she ends up also buying Barilla sauce or she goes to buy uh, you know, Diet uh, Pepsi and she ends up to substitute and buy Diet Coke. So these are also the substitution or complementarity effect that I just explained in this example is also another very important feature to incorporate in the modeling. So <clears throat> we use various techniques to estimate the demand and then feed it in uh, the optimization problem that has the overall goal to optimize the profits for the retailer over the quarter. And the key decisions is which items for which weeks to be set at which price from the price ladder. With business constraints, of the, and here is one, where we say that for each product, you want to limit the number of promotions that you run over a quarter. Because if you run too many promotions, you are going to A, confuse the consumer, and B, you are going to not have the same effect because of the stockpiling effect. In addition, we, we realized that we had to incorporate what is called a no-touch constraint, namely, we had to space out consecutive uh, promotions exactly to avoid the stockpiling effect. And finally, to incorporate inter-item constraints like what I mentioned before, for example, the small size versus the large size, or for example, you want in a group of products to have similar promotions and so on and so forth. All of this gives you know, a technical model behind it as an engine, which is an optimization model, which ends up to be pretty complex and hard. Because the first thing I learned in this industry is that you want to build models that will be run with a cup of coffee rule, namely as long as it takes you to drink a cup of coffee. And because I'm Greek, not me, because it takes me forever, basically. So <laughs> I shouldn't be the criterion. <laughs> uh, so our uh, next goal was to take the complicated model that I described in words before and build a much simpler approach, a much simpler approach that would run in milliseconds, so that it would leave the managers the option to be looking at different scenarios, rerunning our, our model, and uh, deciding at the end what was the best strategy that they want to follow. 
And so to give you an idea of our, of our model, I want you to just focus on this plot that basically is showing you how our approximation model and uh, the, the exact model work. And you see that the blue line is pretty flat. And for, for example, uh, cate 200 categories with 100 items per category, it worked in milliseconds. So how about now impact in practice? Let's sort of look at this particular retailer. We got data from 18 stores for about two and a half years from the coffee category, 32 brands with private and non-private uh, labels. And here you are seeing in the, 35, in the 114 weeks, the corresponding sales that they are experiencing for the different brands. And you can see here that you have the, non, the, the red thing that seems to be, have a lot of spikes in their sales versus the blue curve that seems to be pretty flat. It turns out that this is a premium brand, a non-premium brand that the retailer was promoting a lot versus this is a premium brand that they are keeping pretty flat and they were not promoting much. So after data filtering and aggregation and so forth that I won't go into, um, we created a training and a testing set. And to just give you an idea of the fit, the out of sample mean absolute percentage error, that is a metric in the business that basically is saying how close are your actual sales that this retailer is experiencing relative to what your model is, uh, is predicting. And this was of the order of 11%, 11.4%. And for this brand of coffee, the memory was two. Memory two means basically that the consumers for this brand of coffee remember last week and the week before price. And this is for all 18 stores that we got data from. And you see that basically the best one was 11.4 and the worst one was 30%. And a 30% MAPE in this business is really good, which was the worst case that we saw. And here you also can see the out of sample R squared that were all more than 90%. And this is of course all out of sample namely is on the part of the data that we left aside and we did not use to train our model with, otherwise we would actually be cheating. So let me give you a little bit of information from what did we find from the different products. So this is coffee, chocolate, tea and yogurt and different brands. And you see here that for yogurt we found from the data that the memory is zero. What does this mean? It means that basically consumers do not care about past prices for yogurt. There's a good explanation for that, and the explanation is that yogurt is, goes bad if you keep it for a long time. So as a result, even if this product is on promotion, the consumer is not really going to stockpile. Because if you stockpile, you won't be able to use the yogurt for many weeks. It will go bad. And this we found for perishable items. Also, you notice that for coffee, for example, we found different memory. So for some brands, we found a memory of two, meaning the consumer is remembering up to two weeks, uh, versus for some other brands is zero. And when we looked more carefully into these brands, we found that for luxury brands, the memory was zero, versus for non-premium brands, the memory was higher. Meaning that if this is, say, a coffee that's very luxurious and you really love, you are going to buy it regardless of whether it is on promotion or not, versus if the, uh, the item is non-premium and it's the supermarket brand, then you will be much more uh, open and susceptible to the promotion. Now, how about impact in terms of the prices? We kept the business rules of this retailer as they were. And what we find in, with our model out of sample versus what they were actually doing, a 4.2% improvement um, for a model that our model took to run 0.05 seconds. Uh, and this was the approximation model that I briefly discussed that gave us a value 
98% from the optimal solution of the hard problem that the computer cannot solve. And in general, we found of the order of 3 to 9% improvement for, because here I'm showing you the coffee uh, data, but as I mentioned before, we tried this for yogurt, for tea, for chocolate, and other products, and the improvements we, were find, we would find were between 3 and 9%. And for a tier one client that I described before, it translates into 12 seconds in terms of running time. So the manager can really run different scenarios using our model as a back engine. Now, the next step was to decide how to promote, like how should the retailer select how to promote each product. And as I said, you have different ways to promote. You can promote on the shelf. You can promote with flyers. You can promote at the end of the aisle and different other promotion vehicles. So now you have to decide which products at what time, how and how you should promote each. And we sort of had to obey, again, business rules of the retailer. For example, at each time period, the number of promotion vehicles to use, they had to be limited because using promotion vehicles are costly for the retailer. So for example, they want to say that if they have five promotion vehicles, they only want to use two of them at each week. And also, how many times they used each promotion vehicle over the quarter, they also wanted this to be limited. For example, out of 13 weeks for the flyer, they only wanted to use the flyer up to four weeks. So to make a long story short, we realized technically this is a hard problem, but just going straight to the impact so that I don't waste your time, we found that for the same retailer and for the same product that I was talking to before, where, where with prices only as a lever, we were improving to 4.2%. Uh, now, also incorporating the promotion vehicles as a, a lever, we were able to improve from what they were doing to 7%. And again, the running time was very, very fast, 0 0.07 seconds for the coffee. And then, of course, after this, we went to a live pilot with a client um, of course, the client had to agree to the pilot. There were a lot of issues with data analysis cleaning that I won't bore you with. We chose the pilot and the control stores. We looked at the oil and chemicals category. And as an example, in the control store, we kept the existing policy versus in the pilot store for the pilot product, we used our policy. And to make a long story short, we saw improvements of the order of 10%. So I see there are some questions here, and I would say we started our experiments first with historical data, and that's what I showed you before. And in the pilot, what I'm showing here, this was a live experiment. And yes, we actually had to, uh, to, uh, to, to give to the client who ran the pilot our, um, our promotion recommendations um, several weeks in advance because, for example, as they were printing their, their flyers, they had to actually use this information for the... For the So the answer is, this is the experiment, and the previous <laughs> was, the, again, answering that question. Now, of course, as an academic, we like writing papers, because this is the currency for an academic. Um, so that was, that was satisfying that they were able to, to, to publish a lot of papers. We also filed several joint patents uh, between MIT and Oracle. And we got some recognition from our words, but let me skip to that. And let me tell you a little bit about some cool things that, uh, that we found and we are now working on. Uh, so I touched on the promotion side, but this whole story has many aspects. It is the assortment that you will put on the shelf. It will be the inventory that you should carry. And then, Cooler and newer things, like for example, nowadays retailers have social network information, 
And they also have online stores as well as uh, the regular brick and mortar stores. And it's a challenge how you incorporate all of this information. And we have been also building a model that starts with the genetic information for the consumer and where you have demographics, transaction information, loyalty information. But now we are incorporating in these um, models about the consumer arriving and now you are looking at what they are interested in. So you have more contextual information from the consumer. And as a result, it's both the generic willingness to pay and uh, transaction information that you have, to which nowadays, because you have social media information, because you even have basket information and other such information about the consumer, you can build a much more personalized model than the one I described before. So this is the sort of like the future and the way uh, it's important for retailers uh, to go for. And in general, our philosophy in this is to sort of have a collaboration between MIT and industry, such as people like you here, finding what is the important problem that will not be only interesting for uh, the company, but also for MIT, and will have academic in, in, uh, implications that this would be a very close collaboration with uh, the company. Access, obviously, to data is very important. Um, this allows us to train our PhD students. Remember, I started by saying our goal is to bridge the gap between academia and industry. And at the end of the day, if here at MIT, all the faculty, they strive to have an impact. I know that there are questions that uh, I'm seeing here, and as I'm speaking, I'm not uh, reading very well, but no, that's fine. yeah. We have plenty of time for questions. Yes. So uh, thank you for presentation, sure. and uh, we'll get to the questions. And, and I'm, glad, I'm glad you uh, ended by painting the picture of how companies can engage with MIT Sloan and the Operations Research Center and, and all the other parts that you work with. Um, because we have some new faces in the audience, uh, some companies that aren't yet used to working with MIT and just looking for ideas of how do I take some of this, these things that I've learned and, and, and utilize it further and maybe lead to further engagements with MIT. So uh, with that, we have uh, this uh, pigeonhole application that's uh, bringing the questions to us. So let's see um, which ones uh, look like the most popular ones. You feel, feel free to choose which ones you would uh, want to address uh, first. Yeah, so I'll go with the one that has the most votes. It says, have you built a promotion model designed for manufacturers versus retailers? And the answer is yes. Uh, this was the model that I very briefly described in the beginning that is telling the, ma the manufacturer what vendor deals should they offer to the retailer, meaning how much discount should they give to the retailer to give them incentive to basically pass part of that discount to the consumer. And what we found when we talked to practitioners and we looked was we found that the manufacturers give these discounts, but one important thing that they want to avoid is the retailer keeping the discount for themselves and not passing it to the, compute, to the, <laughs> to the, the consumer. And therefore, by giving them short-term deals where basically they are enforcing in a contract a minimum level of discount that they pass to the consumer, what is called a pass-through constraint, if you like, to the consumer, was sort of an important thing to help implement this so that the retailers do not do a lot of forward buying uh, and then avoid later on you know, passing the discount. Let me see. Um, so I think that uh, different, um, I don't think that I have very good insights to give for the second question because yes, there are different, um, you know, dis uh, promotion vehicles that will will work so for, yeah, yeah, for uh, different consumers. 
but I don't think I have very good sort of simple insights to give from something like this. Okay. From this here. Why don't you choose the question and then they can display it. Yeah. I see, did you? Um, hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe I would like to take actually questions from the audience oh, because. Technology. <laughs> 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 because I think this will make it easier for me. I feel like I'm standing we here can, and I'm we just can reading. Do that and walk the mic around. <laughs> right here. In your research, did you discover an anticipation effect where people wait for a promotion in order to buy a product? I know in apparel this is very prevalent. People wait for things to go on sale and then rush in and buy them. Yeah, so you are absolutely right. And actually, because I've been studying both the apparel industry and the, the supermarket industry, uh, the two actual industries are fairly different because in the, in the supermarket industry, we go to the supermarket very often. And therefore, understanding consumer behavior, such as stockpiling or, if you like, anticipation effect, is something that you can uh, understand much easier and capture much better than you do in um, the apparel industry. In fact, in the apparel industry, a big challenge is potentially not big data, but actually, I would say, little data. So a key part of my research, actually, is how do you deal with little data, missing data, and how do you use this for pricing effects? Uh, and that would be more relevant to apparel. Yes. Uh, in the study, you didn't mention the reaction of competitors uh, in the retail, uh, in the retailer that uh, went ahead with the test. Uh, have you uh, looked into that in, in the studies on a, like a medium or long-term effects uh, in regarding, like for example, uh, provoking price wars that in the end they're not uh, profitable for for the industry? Yeah. So. For the study that I presented here, we did not incorporate uh, competitors because the supermarkets that we were looking at were dominant players. And people you know, tend to go to the supermarket that they go every week. So it's not the type of industry that you know, it's so much often the fact that people go from supermarket to supermarket. On the other hand, when we looked at you know, products such as um, in the facial category, acne products, cleansing products that are not supermarket products, but products that you would get in a pharmacy. There, we saw that incorporating the competitor effect was important because there you might actually just go to a pharmacy versus another, and it's not true that you will be going necessarily to one pharmacy at a time. So a, a question that's getting uh, some mm -hmm. votes here, then they've magnified it here, but any insights about the entire basket of goods that consumers purchased during the promotion? Is there anything um, that stood out to you? Yeah, that basically, um, it, I sort of mentioned it in my presentation a little bit, but it was not as clear, I think, that basically when you are looking at perishable products, people are not caring as much about promotions versus when you look at you know, non-perishable products that will not go, go bad, there is where promotions effect, effect will have a much bigger effect. Because you know that you buy it on promotion and you can store it somewhere in your house and you can actually use it later. So you sort of much more care on the promotion. And I think this one you Yeah, this one I sort of said bit. that I don't have a good yeah, answer. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> that is simple to explain without getting way too technical here. On this one it uh, talks about the model and is there a chance for the brand and product managers to put some of their own intuition or I guess test it against their intuition? Yes, and that was exactly the point because there, there are levers in the model, there are parameters in the model that the, the managers can actually change and rerun the model. And that's exactly why we wanted the model to run in milliseconds. So that, for example, you are saying, well, do I want to promote four times in the quarter or do I want to promote only twice? How do I want to space my promotions? Do I want to sort of space them and have them every other week? Or do I want to space them more? 
And that's exactly what the tool tries to, it tries to empower the managers because as you are saying, this tool needs to be you know, a recommendation that you give that then it needs to be able to be amended by the manager, absolutely. Um, here's one about uh, flyers as well. Many supermarkets send flyers six days ahead uh, before a week of special promotional prices, which allows the consumer to plan. Uh, does this affect the memory and stockpiling effect? Yeah, it does, yes, absolutely. A question with uh, three votes here. Um, Trade promotion management products in the market, and have these been evaluated? So I'm not sure what they mean by trade promotion. I mean, trade deals or vendor deals is what I was talking about. Um, should I assume that they mean the same thing? <laughs> that? Yeah, this was the vendor deals that I was yeah. talking about, exactly. And that was exactly what I very, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but that was the part of the process I didn't discuss, but in the last year we were working on exactly that, which is how much discount does the manufacturer want to pass to the retailer? Exactly, yes. Um, and yesterday we had some talks and discussions about co-creating value between the consumer and the business. Any focus on media techniques where the consumer is invited to participate? So I have been doing one study actually with another colleague where we were trying to understand the, um, the signaling of the pricing and the promotion to the consumer in terms of the quality of the, of the product. And the way we invited the consumer to, to participate is by performing experiments in uh, um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, where you can put surveys and you can have consumers basically answer questions. And, tr and we found out as a long story that basically indeed the promotion uh, depth is actually does give a signal to the consumer in terms of whether this product is uh, a quality product versus not. So that's the closest I have done to that question. And I'm not sure. I think I already answered that. Yeah, I think that we yes. talked about the vehicles. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So okay. any other questions from the audience? Okay. Well, oh, oh. yes. I just want to touch on the question that the gentleman over there asked about the vendor. Yes. So is your modeling applicable to the vendor, not so much on the individual product, but the discrimination, uh, the disbursement of which retailer they offer the discounts to, to pass on to the consumer? And also does it factor in uh, geographical differences and or the impact of holidays? So the model that we build right now is fairly generic. I'm not sure I understood your, your question, but because it's a very generic model, I think that it doesn't matter to what type of retailer you are um, talking about. Well, I, I was getting more in the sense of, let's just think locally here in Massachusetts, um, stop and shop in Market Basket. Would a, re, would a vendor, say a coffee company, Yes. offer both retailers the same discount at the same time. In other words, in, in how yes, would yes. that affect the consumer's choice? Yeah, so we have not used data to answer such a question. So, you know, again, it, it is a generic model, but the truthful answer is that we haven't experimented with data on that question. Okay, and, and did, did, was there any consideration in the retail data that you looked at on, on Holidays? Yes, okay. oh, absolutely. Special events, trends, yeah, absolutely. I didn't go to show any of them, but absolutely, absolutely, yes. yes. Hi, um, congratulations, it's a great uh, exposure there. Thank um, you. Once you find um, data insights, uh, which methodology do you recommend for discover uh, wise? Or, or triggers that consumers do this or do that. Um, 
the you know the the the, the triggers what methodology do you use to discover the triggers that move that data in your analysis so we i'm not sure i fully understand your question but i think this goes more to the personalization yes. where we try to we estimate a, a propensity to buy and we basically identify different personas for the cons the consumers yes and then as the consumer comes in, we look at two things. Generically, which persona they fit in, and then according to what they are looking for, additional adjustment in terms of their persona. So basically, there are two scores. One are these generic personas, but then maybe the same person, if they are looking for different things, then we give them an additional and even more personalized propensity to buy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay, there's a question up there about lifestyle and the time effect of that, uh, or, or, or different uh, demographics, I guess. Um, have, has the model been able to be used across different locations and regions? So because it's, it, is, it can be used at different locations and uh, regions, of course, when we were testing it in terms of the experiment that we did, we wanted to make sure that the pilot and the control stores were in similar locations so okay. that we don't uh, you know, test very different things. But yet, at the same time, that they are not so close so a consumer can jump from the control to the pilot store and confuse the model. I don't think this fully answers the question, but uh, yeah. There's, there's one there. You're close, Laura. Hi. What do you think would be the, the evolution of the model? Because from what I understood, the retailer doesn't know much about the specific person, like how often comes that person into the, into the supermarket, what's the, their journey inside the, the supermarket. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so in the online space, it's much easier to get this type of data, and that's where we are focusing in terms of the personalization part. Uh, now, with a new Amazon grocery store, I believe that if the physical stores move more towards that model, then we can have such information and do this for brick and mortar store as well. Okay. Okay, I think we'll stop there. So, a round of applause for Professor Caracas. <laughs>